it's time to flow with the SEO queen. Receive the perfect leads like never before. No traffic's gonna explode. It's time to grow. Welcome to the Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady C, a podcast about the secrets of success in technology, music, and business on Bashani Radio, iHeartRadio, and iTunes. Bashani Radio, always talking about everything from New York City. You can listen to the Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady Z on any mobile phone or tablet device. The Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady Z, where we explore tech and enjoy the music and learn the secrets to music and technological success. Please follow us online at www.ladyz.com and on all social networks at L-A-D-Y-Z-H-E. Please pull out your phones, and if you're listening on your phones, just hop on over to Instagram and follow me at L-A-D-Y-Z-H-E. My next guest is a multi-award winning storyteller, spoken word artist, playwright, oral historian, singer, songwriter, music producer, filmmaker, and professor. Born in Bronx, New York, and raised in both New York and Mashpee, Massachusetts, he is a graduate of Music and Art High School, now also known as LaGuardia. He's a trained violist, jazz pianist, and composer. He performed at Carnegie Hall before the age of 14, and by 16, he was one of the youngest studio session players in EMI history. He is currently the keyboardist and singer for the multi-Grammy nominated soul funk band, The Groove Lottos. As an iconic part of the East Coast underground art and music scenes for over 30 years, his stages have included theater schools, street corners, libraries, galleries, museums, festivals, powwows, jails, nightclubs, temples, community centers, and colleges throughout the country. He plays solo performance pieces and experimental films. He has been, uh, his films have been presented throughout the USA and Canada, as well as the Caribbean and the UK. He earned his BA in music and MS in film from Boston University and his master's of fine arts in writing from Goddard College. Just a tremendous, Man, I could go on and on and on about uh, him, but I, I want to share these last two facts with you. He is a tenured associate professor of English and Communications and Black Studies at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, where he teaches playwriting, fiction writing, oral tradition, spoken word, Black aesthetics, Black American cinema, and digital filmmaking. And he is also uh, a novel writer. Land of the Black Squirrels is his first novel, and he is the proud father of the ZYG 808. Mm. So without further ado, I want to intru- introduce to some and present to others, none other than the funky professor, Malene. How are you? I'm, I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing last, good. And I'm going to say the last thing you listed is my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> You know what, I, I think, you know what, that young man, I interviewed him last week on the podcast, and I, after the interview, and I was just reading about him, I was so impressed, and I started reading about you, and I was like, okay, now this makes sense. This is this is why he's just as brilliant as he is, because his father <laughs> is a genius, too. <laughs> Oh, man, it, 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 it's, you know, single parenting. Yeah, I and, definitely can relate. I'm a single parent and, as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, your child lives your life. And yep. um, so, you know, his single dad's an artist academic. So that's the world he grew up in. Right, right. You know, it, it's funny because, um, like, some of what I have referred to as my black male photos are pictures of him when he was seven sitting with like Abby Odunowele of the last poets uh-huh. at, at an event that we um, co-performed at and that kind of thing. And I said, one day this is going to be one of the memories that you're going to be bragging about. Like, yeah, when I was a kid, I was hanging with the last poet, you know, but, um, 
but you know, good to see that he absorbed it, absorbed it in a very, very positive way. Yeah, I think I can definitely see and hear the impact of you on his sound because for a young person to have such a sophisticated sound, an older sound, uh, mm. a jazz driven sound, that mm. is rare. You know, because most people yeah. want to, you know, have that trap feel, the trap, um, yeah, the 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 produce, you know, just use Fruity Loops and and see yeah. how you can manipulate what's there in the system versus picking up an instrument and just creating from yeah. there. There's a different the collage, the sound the, in the collage the, method. Yeah, yeah. Collage I mean, method. yeah, when you're creating. When you're creating, when you go into using software, when you do software driven creation versus, you know, acoustic instrument creation. Right, right. There's a big difference. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's funny because it's the industry that creates a sense of either or. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you want, if we were going to compare music to um, visual art. You have visual art that's based on drawing and painting, and you have visual art that's based on collage. There's a form the French call découpage, mm -hmm. which is a collage form. And when you think about it, hip hop is is the découpage, mm -hmm. you know, traditionally of, of an art of a musical artistic form. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, you have the choice of do I want to use real instruments, or do I want to use a collage approach? Right. And sometimes, you know, the true beauty can come with both. You have groups like The Roots, where they're the natural vibe of the music. And you had a group out of California that really didn't, well, it was interesting. They were big in California and then they were big in Europe. And it was only mm -hmm. because I knew DJs that I heard them on the East Coast. But it was a really, really good group, the Booyah Tribe uh -huh. out of California. And they were, they were a band. They were a hip hop band. Right. Of, of instrumentalists. And... Uh, well, I, I can proudly say my, I'm 52 years old, so I remember way back in the day, the um, Zulu Nation parties had real bands along with the DJ. Right. And the MC would rhyme over the real band as well as the DJ. So, right. So real, so real bands are actually part of the foundation of hip hop. And you know, he it's interesting because he does a lot of the trap stuff, but even when he's doing trap, he's using a real drum. Right. Right. I've noticed because he he can he'll sit down and actually play the the thirty second <laughs> on his drums. Right. Um. It's interesting because that actually comes out of jazz. Um. A lot of that trap sound you listen to, the records that came out of like Stax Records, the Memphis right. sound, the old Isaac Hayes, and you listen to what they're playing on the hi hat and like um like listen to Shaft and listen right. to what they're playing in the hi hat. That's trap. Right, right, right. Because now it's being done on a, it's being done on a 808 or an SP 1200 or SP 404 or whatever sampler they're using to get that. But if you listen to it, it's rooted in jazz jazz players who were studio session players R and B records. That's right. what the track, you know. And you know the, the poor young man. I made him actually understand the history of what he wanted to do when he first told me he wanted to do hip hop. One of the first things I had him do was when he went to visit his mother in the Bronx, I said, okay, so you're going to go to 1520 Sedwick Avenue and you're going to take a picture in front of the building for me. And he did it. Mm -hmm. And then and then I told him, okay, now look up why I sent you there. And then he found out about Cool DJ Hurt and the very uh -huh. first hip hop party thrown on August 9th, 1973. Uh-huh. And um, so from there, just help, just making sure that he understood what he was listening to, you know, down to even when um, it was really funny. He and his cousin, when they were first making their music in my basement, they were like, oh, well, you know, it was like, oh, well, you're old. You don't understand. I said, uh-huh. Okay. Let's go to YouTube. And I started taking them through the records I was listening to back in like 82, 83. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, now check out Pumpkin and the All-Stars, King of the Beats. Let's check that record out. Okay, you hear that? Good. Okay, now let's listen to Planet Rock. Ah, now you hearing Planet Rock? Okay. Right. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, I was like, let's take Planet Rock and slow it down. And all that of a sudden... sounds familiar. 
Teach me how to Dougie. Teach me, teach me how to Dougie. Right, 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 right. <laughs> they were looking at you like, what? <laughs> and, and I and I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, and here's some dudes I went here's some dudes I went to junior high school with. The fresh three MCs doing F R E S H Fresh. I'm like, oh, man. notice how that drum machine sounds kind of like what y'all are doing now. Oh yeah, by the way, here's a group that we used to go crazy to in the club called Freeze doing Pop Goes My Love. Check that out. See that be? <laughs> notice how that sounds? Doesn't that sound almost like something that oh came out last week? You know, you know that you know that kind of conversation. But, well, um, I think. I think a lot of young people don't understand the depth and prevalence of sampling from the music in the seventies. Oh yeah, and and beyond. Right, and I I would argue that the golden age of contemporary jazz was the seventies. I, I mean, some of the, I I think some of the most Incredible record and artist mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. came to prominence in the 70s. I would say, yeah, a lot in the 70s. Yeah. An awful lot in the 70s. But when you go back to the 60s mm -hmm. and you read some of what they were doing with Hard Bop in mm -hmm. particular, that's where you can hear how funk for example, really starts to move. Right. You know, um, uh, Cold Sweat by James Brown is considered the original funk record. Okay, okay. Because it's one of the first records where the bass line does not change through the entire song. Is the bass line, whether you're in the bridge or the chorus, the bass player's playing, the same. so they, they yeah. consider that the first funk record. But when you consider the fact that, and you know, we want to talk about sampling, mm -hmm. they're actually, the horn section's actually playing So What by Miles Davis. You know, I'm going to have to go back and listen to that. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that record now. Yeah, yeah, because they're playing So What, but they move where it happens in the, um, where it happens in the measure. Right. You have okay. a do 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 ba do ba do do ba do and then they take that boom ba da boom 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 ba da ba do 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 ba da they take the timing of it. Okay. Boom ba go fast. You know that's what they're doing with it. Right. So, right. Um, right. You know that's that's early. That's actually sampling if you think about it. It really is. I, I was just, I was like, wow. You know, one thing I, yeah. I have been finding is like when I'm listening to music, a lot of songs these days, the new ones, they remind me so much yeah. of previous songs. It's like they're almost copying and pasting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it, it's always kind of been that way. I, I have a bad habit, and it's especially being a musician where I'm listening to a record and I'll start singing the other record that's written over the same changes. Right. Right. You know, you know, um, you know, and, and it's interesting because you have people like, um, um, what's his name? Mayor, um, John Mayer. Yeah. John Mayer. Mm -hmm. who comes, comes out with this record called waiting on the world to change. And I'm like, dude, you stole that from Curtis Mayfield. Yeah. Because I'm listening to waiting on the world to change. And I'm like, we're a winner. And never let anybody say that you can't make it. Those are feeble minds in your way. But don't want tears to be fired. And you finally got our eyes. And we're moving on them. It's the exact same. Waiting on the world to change. The same change. Right, right, same right. It's the same. Everything. Right, but then right, you right. take those same things. But take those same changes and pull the horn arrangement out. And you have Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye. We're a winner. Never let anybody say that you can't make it. Now take that. I've been feeling kind of like it, baby. Trying to find back the feeling for so long. 
And if you yeah. feel like I feel, baby, come on, come on. Waiting on the world to change. Wow. Moving on up. Same, same. Right, thing. right, right. You know, you think about, um, but, but, but that is in and of itself, that is part of the African American tradition because the difference is really the lyrics. Now, I mean, you think about how many thousands and thousands of songs are written over the three chords that are used in the blues. Right. And they're all different songs because they're all because the words are telling a different story, but it's not the music. Mm-hmm. And and that's part of our tradition is that right. you know the tradition becomes the, the structure of the song. Right. 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 That's that's but, um, true. It, it's this the, the the other difficulty, and this is what I've been trying to get us past as a people culturally, is we unfortunately have a legacy of being commodities as black people in this country, as people of color in general in this country. We have a tradition of being commodities because that's the the, the, um, the European addiction is cultural exploitation. Mm-hmm. And if you mm-hmm. and if you think about it to an extent always has been. But when you right, consider in particular right. the United States is based on being a commercial, a mercantile based um business venture, which is why it's a capitalist based country, mm-hmm. when you um consider the fact that our existence has always been a commodity that even after slavery, everything we produced was considered a commodity and a disposable commodity. You know, records were meant to be disposable entertainment. The fact that it went beyond being disposable was not something that they originally perceived of. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the notion was that we would make a record, the record would be enjoyable for a while, and then you move on to the next record. And this and unfortunately, when you have something that's a commodity, it loses actual, it loses actual, I would say, to an extent, cultural value in people's minds. So what happens is we don't stop and really think about the fact that our storytelling traditions that came over from the various countries of West Africa mm-hmm. um, affected the way that we told stories and sang songs when we ended up in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Mm -hmm. it affected how we sang our songs and told our stories and played our drums when we ended up in Jamaica and Antigua and Barbados and Puerto Rico and Cuba. And, you know, and we don't stop and think about then when these cultures start to come back together again during immigration, et cetera, that when these cultures are meeting and we're now forming these new melanges of music, when we're all coming together in the Bronx and we're coming together in Philly and we're coming together in Chicago and we're bringing our musics with us and they're all merging. And now this is becoming soul music. So soul music is taken a little bit from the South and a little bit from the Caribbean and Mm -hmm. a little bit from West Africa and a little bit from the Native American roots and it's all combining. And that's what really makes it soul music. But we don't stop and think about that. We don't think about the fact that our literary traditions, you know, that are, um, that are, you know, our our Tony Morrison's are the literary versions of the griots of West Africa. We, we, you know, we don't naturally make that connection. We don't recognize that if there was not a Harlem Renaissance and if it was not for the artists that the Harlem Renaissance produced, we would not have had the mentors that led to the Black Arts Movement of the 1960s. We just right. act like these are two just completely separate things that happened. No, no. And we now, don't then look at the fact that, and the people from the Black Arts Movement became the teachers of the Urban Expressionist Movement that happened in the 90s. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, right. you know what? I, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I just wanted to, to mention to the listeners that June is uh, Black Music Month, and I believe by the time this episode airs, it's going to be, uh, let me look at my calendar real quick. I think it may be like uh, the first or the, yeah, it's going to be the 2nd of July. But um, in mm. honor of Black Music Month, I'm enjoying this discussion. So can can you start, because you, you started with the Harlem Renaissance, which became the mentors to you said the the black arts movement. Mm-hmm. Okay, and continue. And then the black arts movement, the black arts movement become the mentors basically of what is referred to as the urban expressionist movement, which was the arts movement that sort of happened in 
from the mid 90s to about the mid 2000s where you had a strong resurgence and you had a resurgence with theater mm -hmm. and you know, jazz and of um you know this is when this is when even the commercial side becomes neo soul and it's you know basically okay let's take so let's take 70 soul exactly what you were talking about as an influential period let's take 70 soul and turn up the bass and the drums and we'll call it neo soul mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but this is what happens during that period and of course you think about it um those of us who were of college and early adult age in the from about the mid 80s to the mid 90s. You know, this is the era of public enemy. This is the era of KRS one and Boogie Down production. Hip hop. Right. And of course it's socially conscious hip hop because when you when you look at the um members, for example, of Public Enemy, they were all directly influenced by the Black Panther Party, down mm -hmm. to even being part of their breakfast and after school programs. You know, some of the key members were involved in that in their childhood. These are the influences that, you know, you consider and some the fact of, some that soul singers um, like, after the assassination of... I was saying that Shaka Khan was also involved exactly, in the exactly. program as well. But you oh, were yeah, saying... She was a teenager. She was part of the party. Yeah. Is a, is a really I, important I, point for people to understand from a historical standpoint about you know how the musicians and uh civil rights activists collaborated throughout the years mm -hmm. and inspired each other precisely well um, it, it was all part of the same element you know uh realizing that sam cook and malcolm x were friends that's a point that a lot of people don't consider um, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X also drew inspiration from the music of Ray Charles. You know, mm -hmm. be, you know, um, these are all things that tie together. Soul music, soul music becomes the basis of the initial Black Power movement. You know, the the feedback and forth. The record that was predicted to be the worst selling record in um, Motown history becomes their most classic. What's going on by Marvin Gaye the first time Motown releases the socially conscious record that's addressing the concerns of the black community and not trying to appease white fragility. You mm -hmm. know, um, this, you know, this becomes part of what, what I was saying was in 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, there came what I call the appeasement era. And we're kind of in that again now, you know, 52 years later, in 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, and they were rioting in the streets. Sounds familiar, yes? Right, right, right. <laughs> and right. Um, the, you know, the, the rioting, you know, the rioting in the street factor, and it's like, oh my, and now all of a sudden, the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and IBM, and every corporation that has some kind of foundation is throwing money into the black community left and right, and Madison Avenue picks up on it, and dashikis and afros and black and it's beautiful becomes part of Madison Avenue marketing. And now all of a sudden we're growing, you know, all of a sudden Saturday morning cartoons include black people, you know, the Jackson Five, um, integrated cartoon casts of black, little black and white children now becomes, you know, part of the aesthetic. And the thing is, seeing that I was born in 1968, I'm growing up with this as, okay, this is the way the world is. And then all of a sudden, 1980, a, um, a, part, a pro apartheid racist is, is elected president and we're right back where we were in the 1950s. Bam, like that. Wow. Come from the golden era to, wow, this, we're, back, we're back in the old America. Right. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people did not, and still to this day, do not realize that Ronald Reagan verbally and adamantly supported apartheid in South Africa. You know, not even, you know, it's like there was at least tacit denial. Wait a second, 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 stop. Not stop, him. Stop, 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 stop. You know I'm going to have to <laughs> unpack that. We're going to have to talk about that a little bit. So there is, there are 
a segment of society. There mm -hmm. are black Republicans who mm -hmm. swear up and down that Ronald Reagan was all of that in the bag right. of chips. So, mm -hmm. so he he was a prop proponent of apartheid. He supported mm -hmm. that regime. Yes, yes, he did. Wow. Openly and vocally. You know, I think it's so important. This is why I love my podcast and I love interviewing, you know, my guests because I, I learn something new every day. And I think it's so important for us to have a, a, and, and a I, correct perspective. I, I should also point out that you also have a number of Black Republicans who felt that affirmative action was unnecessary. And what I also find very funny is that many of them got into the positions that they got into because of affirmative action. So you get into the position that you get into because of affirmative action and then turn around and denounce it. Which is retarded. We, we have to stop and look at what well, we, we sometimes have to stop and look at what are the motives mm -hmm. of, you know, that. Um, Post-traumatic slave disorder is right. going to lead to all kinds of reactions, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Right. And, um, not, you know, um, it's black people who become conservative Republicans and become basically, I mean, we, we have what, I'll, I'll call it what it is. What, they are, what you have are black people who become white supremacists. There are such a thing as black white supremacists. We make fun of it on the cartoon, the Boondocks, Uncle Ruckus. Yeah, you have you have your black white supremacists. You used to have you you would have people on the plantation. You know, they reference as Uncle Tom, but you had black people who decided that yeah, I'm going to worship, I'm going to be loyal to Massa, and that's who I'm loyal to, and that's what it's all about. You know, the uh, character that Samuel L. Jackson played in Django. This is, you know, this is a mentality. This is an element of, um, th this is, a, you know, this is part of the post-traumatic slave disorder. This is part of the of post-traumatic stress disorder. When you have people who've been, when, when you have people who become, who are sexually assaulted as children and then become part of the sex industry, this, you know. Right. This, unfortunately, is very much like somebody who has been subjected to white supremacy. The response is not always going to be rebellion. It's going to be complete and total acceptance of this position. Mm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and this, you know, it's the unfortunate thing. It's the unfortunate thing that we see on, on both sides. Not everybody, who, not everybody who's experienced the effects of, of a white supremacist society is going to come out. It, you know, it is going to come out healthy, or at least with a healthy response. Just like, just the same way, not everybody is going to come out with a healthy response to trauma, or right. any kind of trauma. Right. right. Trauma is traumatizing. <laughs> By the and um, the it is, it is, and you know, and the thing that we have to look at is, you know, people then try to divide it between Democrat and Republican, and I'm like, okay, those are two different sides of white supremacy. And people try to divide it between liberal and um, conservative. Well, understand that to be a liberal or conservative means that you're in a place of power. And who has, who has that inherent place of power in this society? So when black people say, well, I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, no, you're neither. You're siding with. <laughs> but but you're actually but you know you're it's it's a complete lack of awareness about how remarkably and the thing is when we go all the way back to the 16 and 1700s 1700s in particular this is where you begin to develop um a black community a free black community that stretches throughout the colonies where you have people recognizing 
we're not going to be part of the actual structure of whatever this new country is. So if we're going to survive as a people, we're going to need our own social, political, and economic infrastructure. So you have people like Richard Allen in Philadelphia and um, Absalom Jones in, in Philadelphia and people like Paul Cuffey in New Bedford, Massachusetts and Prince Hall in Boston, Massachusetts, who are all making these, who are all making these recognitions and are therefore now starting to organize along these lines of social, political and economic infrastructure. So you then begin to see the rise of the free African society you see the rise of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and you then see also the birth of the of the um, African Freemasonic Order. Mm -hmm. And you know the interesting thing that people don't realize with the with the rise with like for example, what made the free the African Freemasonic Order essential was yes, yeah, you know some people look at it as well, you know you had slave owners who were part of the Masons. Yes, you did. You also, but now what this did was it gave black people a worldwide connection. And what we have to remember is that the United States is unique. Freemasonry in the United States was unique because the United States was the first place that had racially segregated Freemasonry. You had Masonry of every race in every other country that had temples or had um, lodges. This was the only one that was racially segregated. So now what you had were black people who had an international connection that had nothing to do with the United States. And this is what made, of course, the infrastructure worry was the fact that you now had a black infrastructure. So when you have a black infrastructure that begins to develop, this is where you start to make concessions. And this is how the game has been played ever since those days. Every time there's a black advancement, you make a concession and the, and the point of that concession is to destroy the advancement. I, I knew I wasn't imagining things. I'm not sure. Who. I <laughs> I mean, what you, you uh, said, it, I was it's just really just. It's just a matter of looking. Oh, no, I was like, oh no, you're not imagining it. This, this is very much what's going on. Yeah, I you know my thing is is you know looking at what's going on now. I know that sabotage for the progress that's happening now is is going to follow and um oh yeah it would behoove us as in in all sectors of society to to think about how the setback can come and and be ready for its presentation so we can fight up against that but i wanted to ask you um when you what 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 what, what we have Uh, I'm sorry. Well, what I was going to say is the recurring that keeps happening is that we fall, we always fall for, we always fall for benevolence, but mm -hmm. it's never actually empowering benevolence that we're falling for, if you will. Right. We we fall, you know, it's it sort of like, you know, if we go back to, um, if you go back to the Jesus parable of, you know, teach a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime, give him a fish and he eats for a day. Well, yeah. what happens is it always ends up being a giving a fish, but it's never the teaching of. You see what I'm saying? It, it's um, even down to when you look at the end of slavery in the Caribbean, the end of slavery in the Caribbean led to a period known as the apprenticeship period. And the apprenticeship period was basically, okay, everybody who was a slave is now being trained how to either run a business or run the country. So we can just go and leave you to your devices. When you look at give, give, but, none, but very little of the give was actually empowering. With the exception of the historically black colleges and even in the structure of the historically black colleges, they were trying to limit what could be done. So do you think that this time around will, will be different? Because you have um, black women are the largest uh, new business starters in the country are obtaining, you know, college degrees at a rapid pace. Yeah. It's going to be different. Um, 
you see, the interesting thing that has historically been the case in the 20th and going into the 21st century is that because of sort of like the double check and balance system, if you will, of racism and sexism, throughout the 20th century, women have been able to get into many places men could not because they were less threatening. I mean, even if you consider the fact that when they started looking at um, office work, office secretary work, et cetera, it was if you let black women in, black men would not get into that office, would not get into that opportunity. It's one of the interesting things that they found when they um, were doing research in terms of small business administration, loans, et cetera, was in terms of how many applications for loans, assistance in terms of startups and businesses or even approaches to startups and businesses were being submitted, and also just in terms of the recognition of business. The other um, aspect of the shift is that this is where the sexism comes in. When they start to now do the advancements, especially as we go into um, from about, I'd say, the mid 90s to the present, the shift becomes where now black men start to advance in the corporate positions what ends up happening is this is now creating a need for entrepreneurship and the women will you know women have always um if you even think about commerce going back to west africa women have always been the lead when it comes to entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and business within the black community um who ran you know who actually ran the store was was the wife was her was was the missus who actually kept the business together nine times out of ten were the women it was you know this, this understanding of the, the um of the commercial and the commerce side so seeing that happen um at this point is sort of like a continuum of what's always been the yeah. interesting thing is that trying trying to do this within a very um sexist patriarchal society this is um, this is sort of like almost a, a complete not almost this is a subversion of that but the interesting change over is that this has always again been the way because it is a racist sexist system this has been a way to even keep um women uh, female-owned businesses down what we're now seeing is that they can't even keep that suppression going because there are so many right it, it's the floodgates have have really opened and i think with um, and it's beautiful technology. I think technology has empowered a lot of people to be able to collaborate without physically oh, yeah. being in the same uh, area. So, it, I mean, it's been a game changer. So we're getting to the end of our time together and I've really been enjoying this. So how can people connect with you? Okay. Well, on social media, you can find me on Instagram at Mualim. That's M W A L I M. You can find me on Facebook at The Funky Professor, D A P H U N. Actually, I'm going to make it easy for everybody. Find me on Facebook at Bronx Boehm, B R O N X B O H E M E, at Bronx Boehm. And um, you can find me at Mualim or at Bronx Boehm also on Instagram. Um, my website is defunkyprofessor.com. And if you go to my website, defunkyprofessor.com slash Bronx Boehm, you can get a copy of my novel, Land of the Black Squirrels. And uh, let's see. Um, a new, speaking of entrepreneurial ventures i'm opening a recording studio and content creation facility up here called polyphonic studios and we offer remote mixing and mastering services for musicians again we talk about technology allowing for collaboration you can record it at home send it to us and end up with a professional product and check us out at polyphonicstudios.com and uh also proud to say the record by the zyg 808 bumpin and the music video for Thumpin, which are premiering on July 1st. And Lady Z is actually one of the, one of the artists featured in our video. Um, that's premiering July 1st. You can find that on Vivo and you can find the single on all platforms. And that's actually the very first product coming out of Polyphonic Studios. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So 
Yeah, that's that's great to hear. So, you know, I, I wish we had more time. I, there's so much we could talk about from music to history to politics. I mean, you truly are the funky professor. And, <laughs> and I want to thank you again for coming on to the Jazz and Tech Lounge with Lady Z. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, let's chat again sometime. <laughs>